All right, well, let's get started. Um, so this is session 32, and we're now at the end of year three of the Worlds of Speculative Fiction series, and this time we are looking at uh, somebody who I was supposed to do uh, and then got sick, so we had to postpone him, uh, Gene Wolfe, who I, I really enjoyed rereading. I, I first started, you know, th this book, The Shadow of the Torture, I got, I think, when I, if I remember right, I was in high school. Uh, many of you probably remember you used to be able to buy, uh, you know, books at, at the, the drugstore, mm -hmm. and uh, they were slowly increasing in price at that time. Uh, this was this is kind of a thick paperback uh, at that time, and I thought it was you know such a cool idea, and then started reading it and, and really started enjoying it. But I, I can't say I fully understood um, many of the words because he uses so many Greek and Latin words at the time. Um, and then, you know, I, I read through the rest of the stuff when I was uh, in high school and, and college, um, and then put it down and, and thought it would be interesting to go back to. Um, there is a good bit of world, world building in this, and we'll talk about that in, in a bit. And he, had, he does have a very interesting biography as well. But I thought we could start by, by looking at a few things that some critics have had to say about Wolf and, and this series in particular. Um, so there's this guy, Baird Serles, who, who wrote The Book of the New Sun, these four books, is too complex a work to evaluate on one reading. It'll undoubtedly be considered a landmark in the field, one that perhaps marks the turning point of science fiction from content to style, from matter, matter to manner. Mannered it certainly is and stylish, but under all that glittering edifice of surprising words and more surprising events and character, is there a story or concept of any stature? And that's kind of an open question. Um, Peter Wright says that uh, Wolf is, in effect, doing sort of sleight of hand with, with, with language. He says, coming to understand the book of the new sun is like learning the rules of a game. If the reader succeeds in perceiving the rules of his literary game, achieves the reconciliation of plot with story, then the experience of reading becomes an educational one. And he says that Wolf is not preoccupied with demonstrating how proficient he is as a writer. He's concealing his, slight, his narratological sleight of hand in constructing a puzzle. So he tries to alert the reader to the level of perception required. So these have become difficult books. Some people have likened this to, you know, science fiction's Ulysses. And I have to admit, I, you know, Ulysses was a, a book that everyone told me I had to read. I gave up on within uh, a few pages because I said, I'm not going to read this stuff. You know, I, I have other things to do. But that, I, I didn't do that with this. And he goes on and he says, The Book of the New Sun does not invite the reader to marvel at how clever Wolf can be, but to marvel at his or her own intelligence in perceiving one facet of the elaborate textual game the author plays. And so if he's right, that means that it's, it's, a, um, it's a series that allows you to be self-congratulatory in saying, look how clever I am in figuring out how clever this guy is. Um, and, you know, I, I remember in, in one of my philosophy classes, um, my mentor was teaching Derrida. And Derrida is somebody who plays with words a lot. And, and he, we were reading through one of his more recent books, and he said, you know, we, it was, we went through this chapter and all these allusions, and he said, you know, as I was sitting in my study at home, I thought to myself... Um, as I finished up with this chapter, oh, it's so great I can figure out all these illusions. And Derrida is very clever in that he gets you to get hooked in that way, and then you forget to ask yourself, is any of this true or is it all bullshit? You know? And so with philosophy, right, some of it should be true. With a novel, it doesn't have to be, right? Um, so maybe there's different rules. The third person I thought would be kind of interesting, Neil Gaiman has a very short essay on how to read Gene Wolfe, and he gives you nine rules. I, I won't read all of them, but he says, uh, first, trust the, test, the text implicitly. The answers are in there. And then he says, don't trust the text any further than you can throw it. If that far, it's tricksy and desperate stuff and may go off in your hand at any time. So he's already contradicting himself from one uh, to the other. 
And then he says, reread. It's better the second time. It's even better the third time. And anyway, books will subtly reshape themselves while you're away from them. Um, scrolling down, or not scrolling down, but reading down a bit. You can see how influenced we are by technology. He says, there's two kinds of clever writer. The ones who point out how clever they are and the ones who see no need to point out how clever they are. Gene Wolfe is the second kind, and the intelligence is less important than the tale. He's not smart to make you feel stupid. He's smart to make you feel smart as well. Same sort of uh, line as, the, as what Peter Wright was saying. Uh, and then the, he concludes by just saying, be willing to learn, <clears throat> which is kind of an interesting thing to say about you know, fantasy or science fiction, which is supposed to be... You know, uh, I mean, what would you say the, the point of science fiction or fantasy is? It's, it's to imagine things differently, but it's also to entertain and to provide enjoyment to us, not necessarily to make us jump through a whole bunch of hoops, right? I mean, what, what do you think? Well, some find jumping through hoops enjoyable. Yeah? Sometimes you have to jump through hoops. Sometimes they want you to be political. Sometimes they want you to think yeah. about moral issues. So there's a lot there. Science fiction is really more like that than a lot of other genres. Yeah, it's interesting with Wolf. You know, he he complains in one interview about people, um, creative writers, writing stories that are uh, too political or too too moralistic. And he said oh, that yeah? he said yeah he says in that 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 their creative writing teachers reward that activity too much, oh. <laughs> which which might be you know the case. Um, so, uh, to be speculative fiction, it has to have some hoops to jump through. There has to be some com complexity to it. Well, to be speculative fiction, you're saying. So, the, so would that mean that some science fiction is not speculative yeah, some fiction? Science fiction is not speculative fiction. Okay. It's, it's the Buck Rogers, Cowboys in Space type stuff. It's, yeah, space that's, opera. They yeah, usually call it. Right? Yeah. Stuff that's not particularly speculative. I mean, that's an interesting way to look at it because usually it's, it's so speculative fiction is the super genre and then you've got you know fantasy science fiction horror uh some sub genres like dying earth is actually a, a genre or alternate history or things like that but what you're saying is that sort of at the core of speculative fiction is there better be some speculativeness mm -hmm. to it right yeah okay there's got to be some depth to it yeah that i could that, that, that makes some sense um, so let's, let's talk very briefly, if, 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 well, we can go into as much of it as you want, but let's talk about his, his biography. He's a living writer. He's, he's not that far from here. He's down in Peoria still. Um, so, uh, and my, you know, I, I mentioned that to my wife today, and she said, why don't you go visit him? And I was like, I thought, well, he probably has a lot of people coming to, to, you know, visit him. There'd probably be a lot of a bother. Uh, you know, he's, he's, I'm sure he's got fans who have been, you know, asking him all sorts of foolish questions for years and years and years. So I, I, I don't know that I would do that. Um, so he's born in, in Brooklyn, and they fairly quickly moved to New Jersey, and then they moved to Peoria, and there he actually meets a girl who I think she's four at the time. Uh, he will eventually marry. Um, they're, they're playmates. And then in, in, you know, two years, they moved down to Houston, Texas, and his father was a traveling salesman, so he, he covered Texas, Oklahoma, and Louisiana. Um, so he, and that, you know, think about what it must have been like back then. You know, even now, we're talking about a massive territory that it would take quite a, a while to drive around on roads where we can drive, you know, 70, 75 miles an hour, probably, probably faster in Texas. And um, think about what it must have been like at, at that time. That so, that was Dust Bowl, I remember. Um, Oklahoma. 30, yeah, 37. 37. Yeah, that certainly would have been. Would have been. Um, so, he, you know, Wolf was reflecting on um, his father having a job during the Depression. And he said in one interview, We traveled from place to place wherever my father could find work. But I'll say this, we always had a place to live, we always had food. He said one time he was talking about this with Ben Bova, another science fiction author, and Ben Bova said, well, we didn't. Uh, ben Bova's dad was a, a day laborer, and if he didn't get work, then the Bovas didn't eat. Uh, whereas the wolves, they, they did all right. Um, 
he starts doing some some you know writing. He goes to Texas A and M University. He publishes uh, uh, one of his first stories in, in this this uh, the Commentator, and then he he drops out of A and M and he's drafted uh, for the Korean War and he sees frontline action. Um, now. In some things, he's listed as being a combat engineer, but he says that he was in the infantry. And, and having been a combat engineer myself, I can see how you could you could easily put those two together because combat engineer squads are often separated off from their company and assigned to like a, a company of infantry. And when you're not doing engineering stuff, you're basically just doing infantry stuff. Um, so, you know, it's, it, it's conceivable that he was, he was doing both. And um, the war, you know, he said had a, had a big influence on him. Um, he said that when you're in combat, it's very different than, than being, you know, behind the lines. Uh, he actually used the term bean counter uh, uh, for that, people who would, you know, be doing the supplies. And he said that... Um, he was asked what he learned from being in war, and one of the things he said was, uh, well, you get to see through all the lies that people tell you about, about what's, what's going on. Um, so, uh, you know, that had some, some influence on him. Um, he then starts, you know, you get to, he, he goes back and, and earns his, uh, his bachelor's in mechanical engineering, and he becomes an industrial engineer for Procter & Gamble. He helped to develop a machine that cooks the dough to make Pringles potato chips. So if you enjoy Pringles, uh, Gene Wolfe is partly responsible for that. I know my wife enjoys them quite a bit. And then he starts, uh, um, you know, he starts doing some, some more writing, and he eventually quits his engineering job and, and takes this job as an editor of a, a trade journal, uh, Plant Engineering and relocates to, to Barrington. And while he's doing this, um, this work as a, a, um, an editor, he also starts working on, on these, these novels. And his, his process was quite interesting. He'd have you know, certain times of the day where he'd get to write, and then he said that if he woke up early... Uh, provided it was before, if it was after 4.30 in the morning, I guess he, he must have had some insomnia, he would um, get himself, you know, situated and then just start writing. So he found ways to make the time work for him. And you notice that um, he starts, you know, winning some awards. Uh, he's got some books being published, and then The Shadow of the Torture is coming out in, in 1980. And, and he took his time working on, on those books. Um, once those books caught on, he decides that he's going to become a full-time writer. Um, those, uh, these books essentially cement his reputation. These are viewed by, by uh, many as his, his best work, although he's written a lot of other books as well. And you notice once he does become a full-time writer, he's very productive. It's just, you know, book after book after book after book. Um, some of those are continuing the story found here. Many are in, in other um, uh, areas. And um, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't do an awful lot of other stuff. He's not, you know, jumping around the, 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 the country or the world. Um, but he's, you know, he's, he's living his life. Um, his wife eventually um, dies. 2013, and uh, his his vision is apparently not that that great anymore. But um, you know he's he's uh, you know 2015, a borrowed man came out. So there were a few other things that that were coming up in interviews that I thought were kind of interesting. His reflections on um, his own life or on his. Uh, his uh, religious commitments, and then about science fiction and fantasy. So I thought I would read these to you. Um, he was asked by one person, what is your faith stance and how does it affect your writing? He said, I don't know what you mean by faith stance, because that's just kind of jargon. And he said, I'm a Christian. As a Christian, I, re I reject belief in fate. I believe in free will and original sin. I'm not a pacifist, and I don't believe it's wrong to dance or take a drink. 
Um, and then the person followed in, in another interview, followed up and said, it's not too personal a question. Do you consider yourself a professing Catholic? And he said, yeah, I go to mass, I receive communion, I pray. And then he says, were you born a Catholic? No, I was a convert. And then the person said, oh, like Chesterton. And he said, yeah, it, it, but it's a, you know, it's a bad thing in that born Catholics tend to look down on you, but being looked down upon has its advantages. And then he said, well, like what? And he said, well, you don't put yourself forward as an expert. You understand other people who are in similar situations, not just in religious matters. And so in his, he's sort of very matter-of-fact about this. It's not like you know, he had a one, you know, sky opening up, you know, religious conversion. He just decided he thought that, uh, you know, sort of like Alistair McIntyre, who's, who's a still living a uh, contemporary virtue ethicist who at one time was a hardcore Marxist and then made his transition to virtue ethics and eventually became Catholic and, and still teaches, I believe, at Notre Dame, um, although he may have retired from teaching duties. Um, somebody asked him, well, why are you a Catholic? And he said, well, because I think it's true. And that's pretty much it. You know, and then somebody, they're trying to probe a little bit further. Well, you know, do you do any special things? He said, I go to Mass. That's it, you know. Why do you go to Mass? Because I want the Eucharist. And it's, it's just sort of very uh, basic uh, orientation towards that. Um, the other thing that he talked about was fantasy and science fiction. And in, in one interview, somebody said, your fantasy seems much truer to reality, truer to what we humans experience in this life than most of what passes for realistic mainstream fiction. And, and I really like this observation that he has, and you guys can say whether you think this is true or not. He says, fantasy is nearer the truth, that's all. Realistic fiction is typically about a married couple, both college teachers, he's cheating on her with a student, so she cheats on him with whoever's handy, angst abounds. How true is that story for the bulk of mankind? Realistic fiction leaves out far, far too much. And he, he says, how old is realistic fiction and how old is fantasy? And I, I think he's He's probably right about that. It, I mean, a realistic fiction is realistic for the people who are the, in those situations, uh, and the ones who often become writing teachers. Um, and there it tends to be this kind of, uh, in writing communities, this kind of, um, you know, not, uh, what's the word? It's not claustrophobic, cloistered, right? The, their concerns are the concerns that they think everybody has, and um, everybody in their little sphere does. But then there's a much wider sphere that, that could be talked about. Um, a little bit later, he, he said that he thinks that science fiction maybe has a, an advantage over fantasy. Um, he was asked, why does science fiction matter? And he says, I think it matters because it's mind-opening. That's its great virtue. Ordinary, ordinary fantasy opens minds, but not nearly as much. And so he talks about the Oz books, he says, the Oz books may open somebody's mind a little bit. Alice in Wonderland is kind of mind-opening, but a lot of science fiction is much more so. He says, for instance, I could write a story in which a man has a conversation with his gun. I might do that sometime. Um, now, you know, could, could Lewis Carroll have done that? I think so. But he seemed to think that science fiction has an advantage over fantasy. And I was curious to see what you guys think about that. Does it, in terms of... Well, in terms of speculation, you know, do you think we can like arrange like a, a hierarchy of, of genres in terms of which can be most speculative? I'm wondering how we define the terms. Like, yeah. if a talking gun is science fiction and not fantasy, yeah, how is that science fiction? Ian Banks is guns talk. That's true. That's yeah. True. Yeah. yeah. Of course, there. But, but that, that's within a, another context. It's not just about the talking guns. It's just about what? It says not just about the talking guns. Yeah, it's because they're, they're, they're AIs, AI. right? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, yeah. It's within the context Philip of Dick has, That's the point, I think. Yeah. Philip Dick has a, a, a story, and I don't remember which one it is, but a guy can't get out of his apartment because he has to pay... Uh, his door to let him out, and he's he's run out of money. Yeah, and yeah. every single thing talks to him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's sort of like if but, if, yeah. if what. Oh, well, that's happening, isn't it? Well, the Internet of Things. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, smart houses. Yeah, I don't think I, I I don't think I actually want to live in a smart no. house. No. Do you? No. Not me. Yeah. So um, the uh, the world that this is set in, and, and you know the. 
th there is, I think, arguably a, a genre, uh, a sort of subgenre of, of dying earth stuff. We talked about Vance mm -hmm. last time. There's, there's plenty of other things like that. Um, this is similar to, to Vance's Dying Earth, and, and you know, Wolf actually, I think if I remember right, met, not in these books, but mentions him in, in some, some interviews. Um, you've got a, a world uh, where mankind has gone out to the stars, and there's still the possibility of doing that, but most people don't do that and never dream of it. And things have you know, sort of devolved to essentially kind of a feudal, medieval sort of level with, with some advanced technology in it. And you've got this, this commonwealth, and, and you, I gave you a map, which is not particularly detailed, but detailed enough, and you can see you know, where um, Severian is, is, is going and, and where the, the threat from the north from Ascia is is coming, and apparently this is supposed to be South America. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it looks a lot. Like but this is way more near future than I realized. The continents still look like themselves. Yeah, apparently there's been some some you know reclamation of land from the ocean and some some modification of things and and uh, so you you know you've got a very hierarchical society where at the top you've got the autark, the single ruler, right, the the, the one who who uh, Essentially, is is a not a, even a hereditary dictator because it's passed on from person to person. Sort of like a, for for quite a while, um, rule was in the Roman Empire, and below him you have all these different strata of people. You have like a noble class, the exultants, um, who you you know you have to be born into that. There's the petty nobility, the armigers. Who, uh, who are military class, you've got the optimates, these wealthy traders, um, and then you've got all the, the regular people, then there's slaves, and, and you can fit in to any of these sorts of things. And the story of um, uh, the main character is, is going to be, you know, going from the bottom all the way to the top um, at, by the end of the, the fourth book. And um, there's all sorts of, you know, crazy creatures, um, again, similar to, to Vance's world, right? It's um, called Vancean. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. the word they use. Yeah. He's Vancean in other ways, too. How so? Long lists, especially food. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, average descriptions of the physical environment. What do you think about the language, too, right? Yep. You know, yep. using lots yep. of... Uh, mm -hmm. Although Vance invents words. Yeah, and uh, and he doesn't always invent words, but I mean words. But he does a lot of it. And but whereas, uh, Wolf takes his words from uh, yeah, yeah, the, he, he, he's appropriate. Yeah, uh, some of the translation. Oh cool. yeah, the, I, those things in the back, right? He, so, he, did, he had no recourse to invented terms. He just reused. Yeah. So each book so concludes with a little, you know. I mean, the whole thing is supposed to be a, a, a translation of something that mm -hmm. this guy. Found and so there's always this Post appendix. Historic. Yeah, so the second one has like social relations in the Commonwealth, money measures and, and time. You know, sort of explaining bits and pieces. And it's not like a complete encyclopedia of, of this universe, um, but he is at least telling you something about uh, where where things fit in. And and you know, yeah, Wolf is very erudite, so he's using a lot of things from ancient and, and medieval history, he's reappropriating those uh, words. And then he, he does, I guess he does make up a few, right? I'm, I'm like, sure. like Kakogen, you know, but that's coming from Kakos, meaning the, Maybe, yeah, the sure. bad people, you know. Um, yeah. So I had a few, uh, you know, before I say this, before I talk about the philosophical themes, a little bit about the world building. Those of you who've, who've read this, um, would you say that he actually did world building in any like systematic way? Or would you say it, it's more just sort of, he, he invents the parts that he needs here and there to fit the story? I mean, think about like Tolkien as like the archetypal world builder. You know, he creates languages, um, he has genealogies of, of people. Uh, whole back histories. 
is Wolf doing something like that, or is he more just kind of, I don't want to say making it up as he goes along, but... Uh, that's what it sounded like. Yeah. You think it's making it up as he goes no, along? No, that's what it sounded like you were saying. I, I'm not oh. sure how he did it. He might have plotted the whole thing out ahead of time, but probably not. Yeah. I, Ask him. Are you more likely to... Are you more likely to run into like plot issues if you just kind of make shit up as you go along? Well, I, I don't think you just totally just you know, stream of consciousness, right? I think there is some some sort of charting things out, but I don't think it's it's so elaborate as like what uh, uh, Tolkien or, or some other people have have done. Um, yeah, and you would run into problems because you got to keep track of all this this stuff. There's there's a couple problems that would. This is a little bit off topic, but it's a really good topic to think about. There's a couple problems that when writers are working on uh, something that has like grand scope, they run into. You see this happen with TV shows all the time and with, with movies where you start out and you've got a really cool storyline with compelling characters and you've sketched out like, you know, like this much of the universe and there's all this other stuff to explore. Um, this is what happened with like Stargate, for example. Uh, happened with um, uh, Babylon Five. You, you, so you've got some stuff going on. You've got a, you know bad guys that you have to discover how they work and figure out how to defeat them, and then you do defeat them. And now you've expanded your your scope a bit more. You know a bit more of the universe, and you've got some responsibility. And now you're in the uh, expansion phase, and everything's really great at that time. The fans are like, "This is this is cool stuff," and the writers keep writing away at it. And then they start running out of ideas, and they start, you know, having trouble figuring out how to. It's almost, you know, we often use this term Deus ex machina, right? You know, mm-hmm. got the you, you just yeah. sort of like, but the bad guys are often that in 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 quite a few of these uh, long narrative stories, because you just like make up some terrible menace that. How could we possibly resist that? You know, oftentimes, they're the ones who destroyed the previous menace, right? And then, now, if you defeat them, what's left? You know? So it's, it's kind of like going for the, the next higher and higher and higher sort of thing. And yeah, or like higher. if you think about, about video games, right? You have bosses and levels mm-hmm. and stuff like that. At a certain point, it becomes so unbelievable um, that it becomes kind of boring. And I think a lot of writers working for like sci-fi television shows um they there's something about the the process they 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 just don't think about well what are we going to do three years from now to keep telling this story um and and you can't just keep telling the same story over and over again there has to be some sort of growth right Um, i don't know the characters are good you could just keep they doing it indefinitely? Same, how about Stargate? They kept telling the same stories over and over again. The gold never went away. Well, the Daleks they, keep coming back. Yeah, that I like, uh, with, with Doctor Who. Who. <laughs> with, with Stargate, they, did, they, they wound up um, having bigger and bigger enemies. They had like these replicators. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, for, I forget who else. They, there was some, some other right, race right. that... But the gold never went away, did they? No, but they wound up sort of having to ally right, with yeah. the, the... Forming an alliance against the replicators. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, you know, if you beat the replicators, what then? You know? On the other hand, Wolf, he starts right at the beginning telling you that uh, in four books from now, you're going to find out that I'm the autark. Yeah. Yeah, he knew where he was going with it. I get the impression that he wrote these as one book and had to break it into four because, like, this does not have a climax and it doesn't really have an ending. Um was interesting. Even the end book doesn't really have that much of an ending, I would say. You know? Um, yeah, I think uh, he was working on these over a, a long period, and he he um, he said that, you know, he had the luxury of being able to work on them and not having to publish them right away. Um, so he kept, kept editing and editing and editing. Um, yeah. Well, well so, I, have his, I have his Beyond Science Fiction too, though. Um, right now, I'm thinking of right, there's a series on television called How to Commit Murder. Mm-hmm. Or are you and talking about the dynamic of uh, the dynamic of, the... of having to? Okay, now we add another villain, or now we add yeah. another twist, and you, you can tell it's like okay, they're going to add something now. <laughs> you know? Yeah, you, you can see it coming, almost. Mm-hmm. And they they finish a storyline, and then they've got to create a new storyline. 
because they finished the storyline. <laughs> yeah, I suppose detective shows are probably subject to that, right? Uh, especially if they're character driven. Well, they just come up with new cases on detective shows. Well, detective shows, new yeah. cases. And new, but new like recurring enemies too. You got to have like a nemesis in the uh -huh. background. Like mm -hmm. the Mentalist had that weird epilogue season after Red John was defeated. I, I never watched that. So. They decided to just do it. They switched to character driven, which was yeah. interesting. Yeah. I'm always kind of interested in when the plotting just fails. I love a bad plot, rather, or better yet, no plot at all. So I enjoyed this. My, <laughs> my, my, my wife uh, got into, over the last month or so, watching The Blacklist, uh, oh. which is actually kind of, you know, at some point, science fiction. -y. Yeah, you know? I, I gave up on it. I just couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> I, I only watched it because it's got James Spader in it. I like I like him because um, a lot of the writing is quite bad, you know. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, after that Mr. Kaplan thing, that, that just did it. After well, the woman, I said, you know what, this is enough. I, it, it was getting so ridiculous after like three or four seasons. I just yeah. you're knocking off the characters. I like this. Is I'm done mm -hmm. with this. Yeah. Well, but, but so the, the the point that I was going to make is that it seems like they kept doing the same sort of thing too, and and, and we we watched up to you know it's still an ongoing show, so now uh, we're waiting to find out who the next villain is. You know, they they have like uh, episode villains, mm -hmm. the people yeah. on the blacklist, mm -hmm. yep. but then there's these people in the background right, that are you know right. like the really bad guys trying to do this or that. You know, um, the secret society type. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and the, it's hard for me to watch in part, except for that I like James Spader because it's so far fetched. You know? <laughs> like you know, it has all of the, the the terrible tropes of like the hacker gets in there and just does types a few keys, and now they're they've they've gotten into the the mainframe of you know whatever place it is. And uh, we were joking that every single major character gets abducted at least you know twice during a season and then has to be rescued <laughs> well, and the entire, the it's entire, very much like a the entire series is like no the fbi would not do that yeah <laughs> there's no way that would happen <laughs> well i don't think it's meant to be real it's meant for entertainment but you know I'm, I'm just getting an aversion to really ridiculous violence so that's the reason why i'm mm -hmm. stopping a lot of things and just i've just kind of had it as an overload yeah you know there's that um there's something to that, I think. No, I get it. There, it, it it's, it's very easy. I mean, I lots of violence is just sort of easy writing, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I can't do it anymore. And, and, you know, I remember watching, again, we're very far off topic with this, but I remember watching one of those Bond movies with uh, Daniel Craig in it, and after about um, 15 minutes of watching it, I was like, I can't watch this anymore because the fight scene was going on for about five minutes, and I was like, Jesus, just just one of you like knock the other one down. Yeah. I I want to see like some dialogue or some some plot or a gadget, so, you know, something happen. Um, well, it's not that far off track because in science fiction you see some mm -hmm. of that, both in the books and in the movies, you see some of that gratuitous violence. And, yeah, yeah. You know, they just the, skip ahead. The stuff. But in the movies, you have to close your eyes and think about other things because you're stuck in the theater. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, don't go to those. But you, you see those. You see that in the genre. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, this severity and this torturing. I mean, that was just a little bit grim too. I mean, as, as part of their punishment, you get you get sentenced to either a lifetime or six months of, and then very precise methods of pain. He didn't really go into it. No, I mean, but they were talking yeah, about it in there. Right. Yeah. He also said he wasn't going to bore you with it. Well, he didn't say it that way, but he said he wasn't going to. Well, they, they talked about a few things that they had. Right, they, yeah. they said, I'm not going to do it anymore. Until he showed mercy, and then they yeah. kicked him out. But, um, but just, just the well, idea but he, of having he, does, he still does torture work after that, you know, even after he gets Oh, yeah, well, then, then he becomes yeah. like an executioner. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, I mean, but he's very clinical about it. There's no, mm -hmm. there's no yeah. remorse or anything like that. It's just his job, and he sees it. Because as part of the guild, this is what uh -huh. they do. You know, they just inflict misery on human beings, and that's that's their job. So just, and just just the amount that they've been detailed to do too. Because mm -hmm. if yeah. they go over, you know, if they if they were sadistic about it, then then they wouldn't be good at at what they're supposed yeah. to do. Yeah, that's right. They can't get carried yeah, away because great it's so scripted. I don't they, know they stopped they have to having do. women be torturers because they were too violent. <laughs> I thought that was interesting. Um, but I also love that they call their prisoners the clients. Yes, yes. <laughs> it was like my favorite part. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> yeah, it's not, not, not really a service you'd want, I suppose, as one of, one of those clients. Yeah. It kind of reminded me of like kind of how like everybody views the tortures that like within that universe. Kind of reminded me of like the history for surgeons, how they were viewed like historically, because mm -hmm. like they were kind of like nobody really wanted to like. Yeah. Not like unclean, but like not really. Not like, savory. Clean. That's for sure, right? right. Uh, well, you know, there was the working on cadavers, which was already viewed as uh, morbid, and uh, you know, you'd want you want to know why somebody was cutting people open like that, and and the surgeon could say, well, so I can save lives or something like that. Oh, but right. I don't think a lot of people bought it at the time. Well, know. those are for religious reasons too. There was a lot of that. You know, you you didn't this you know, immoral the body, yeah, mm -hmm. and, yeah, and that's why it was illegal for so long to do that. So, but I mean, how else you going to learn anatomy unless you're looking at it? Yeah, quite true. Um, still a problem in some, some parts of the world today. Um, well, so I had some philosophical themes picked out that I thought would be interesting to, to bring up. Um, I think one of the biggest ones is, is personal identity. Um, you know, you could say the whole novel is about Severian finding out who he is. Uh, turns out that uh, he does find out like who his father is possibly is, uh, and then he also finds out that he's the, the person destined to become the, the next autarch, and he begins from, you know, this very humble uh, beginning as an apprentice, um, and so there, there's all of that, I mean, what do you call that, like a buildings roman or coming of age thing going on, um, and, and that has to do with like figuring out who you are, but a lot of it is also growing into who you are. Um, and then another aspect is, is also figuring out who the hell are all these other people, you know. Um, for example, the uh, Dr. Talos and Balanders, the, the relationship between them. Uh, clearly, Dr. Talos is, is kind of a, um, what would you call him, sketchy guy, right? He's, he's uh, on the make. Um, he's... Uh, well, you talk about people who in, in, in earlier times were considered disreputable. He's, uh, uh, he's putting on plays, you know, and actors were in the Middle Ages were considered quite disreputable. Um, and then uh, Bolanders looks like he's actually his um, servant or, or something like that, but it turns out that's completely the opposite. Talos, is, by, we find that out, I think, in the third book, Talos is, is actually working for Bolanders, and Bolanders is the... The, uh, the one who's calling the, the shots. Um, then you also have Agia. You know, at first it seems like she's somebody uh, quite, quite nice, and um, then it turns out she's somebody quite terrible. And, but, you know, not, she's terrible in that she, she wants to kill Severian uh, and, and trick him, but, you know, maybe she's not that big of a threat. But then suddenly she turns out to be way more of a threat. She's able to recruit assassins, uh, she's dogging him from place to place to place. Um, there's also the character Dorcas who has to figure out who, who she is. Turns out she's dead uh, and has been brought back to life. Um, well, and she didn't remember anything. That's what I said. She can't remember. Yeah, yeah. But so um, Wolf himself says in the book of the New Sun, I wanted to show a man who was raised to do terrible things and who reforms himself from the inside. And so I thought up the Guild of Torturers and made the man a torturer. So that gives us some of the character development arc. But then he complicates it, I mean, really early on by having, um, you know, this, this possibility of having other people inside of you um, through this, uh, I forget the name of the, the, um, the animal that... When it consumes you, this alien animal. That, yeah, yeah, what is it called? That, uh, somehow it was kind of vague, but somehow when you eat the flesh of the person that they interacted with, you get the memories. you get the memories. Yeah, and and yeah. and you have them sort of. It's not just accessing their memories; you have them within you. As yeah, they you talk to your memories sometimes. Right? He gets confused sometimes. Yeah, yeah. that's um, why people read it two or three times because they're not sure, and then they come back and they say, "Well, that's what's going on." Yeah. Do you ever look at one of the websites dedicated to Wolf? Uh, I'll just tell you what's very common there. On my third reading, I discovered <laughs> that's very common. Yeah. I do that all the time on those websites. 
No, I, I looked more at the ones that had interviews with him, but yeah, that, I'll, I'll have to do that. You um, know, in terms of, uh, of, of this, the uh, coming of age, yeah. And, you know, it kind of relates to the fact that he had a crisis of conscience several times. You know, he, he really felt he had to put the fact that he was killing people and torturing them in the context of his guild in order to do it because he did have bad feelings about it. Um, yeah. It started with his first girlfriend. And, in fact, um, there's a lot of teenage boy stuff in here. He falls in love with every mm-hmm. woman he meets. <laughs> yep. <laughs> except for <laughs> except for Jelanta. And that's right? and that's just yeah. you know typical. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, so that's pretty good. I think that's good because it's yeah. all so heavy coming from this guy who's the autark, yet he's telling you about his alleged memories, and he's just showing you what he was a kid. It's, I think it's interesting, but not saying I was a kid. I fell in love with her. And yeah. I fell in love with her. It's hard to see how he, he wouldn't, given the way that she's depicted, how he wouldn't fall in love with uh, uh, Thecla. Thecla, yeah. I wanted to say Thea, but that, that's her, her sister, yeah. Um, you know, she's beautiful, she's, she's uh, exotic, she's this damsel in distress. There's actually a, a line um, that I, there, there was a, a, dis, a discussion that they had um, that I uh, wanted to bring up because it has to do with philosophy. So uh, he's recalling this later on in the Claw of the Conciliator. He says, at 16 or so, Thecla was attracted, as I think young women often are, to, to these lectures on theogony, theodicy, and the like. And I recall one particularly in which a failed uh, Foybad, I guess it would be pronounced, put forward as the ultimate truth, the ancient sophistry of the existence of the three Adonai, the, the three lords, that of the city or the people, that of the poets, and that of the philosophers. Her reasoning was that since the beginning of human consciousness, there have been vast numbers of persons in the three categories, so the, the, uh, the, the regular people, right, the poets, the people who are working with imagery, and then philosophers, there have been uh, vast numbers of pe- persons in the three categories who have endeavored to pierce the secret of the divine. If it does not exist, they should have discovered that long before. If it does, it's not possible that truth, with a capital T, itself should mislead them. Yet the beliefs of the populace, the insights of the rhapsodists, and the theories of the metaphysicians have so far diverged that few of them can so much as comprehend what the others say, and someone who knew nothing of any of their ideas might very well believe there's no connection at all between them. And then her, her answer to that is, is this. May it not be, she asked, that instead of traveling, as has always been supposed, down three roads to the same destination, they're actually traveling towards three different ones. After all, when in common life we behold three roads issuing from the same crossing, we don't, all, we don't assume they all proceed towards the same goal. I found and find this suggestion as rational as that it's repellent and it represents for me all that monomaniacal fabric of argument so tightly woven that not even the tiniest objection or spark of light can escape its nets in which human minds become enmeshed whenever the subject is one in which no appeal to fact is possible. So very metaphysical speculations. And this is Severian saying this about about Thecla's stuff. But, you know, she's, she's, she's sort of like the total package. She's, she's you know, uh, noble, she's beautiful, she's intellectually gifted. How could he not uh, fall in love with somebody who can come up with these sorts of uh, interesting insights into to things? You, you were know? reading that? Yeah. Yeah, that was one of those where I thought I needed a third reading to figure out what was going on. And I still don't know. That's pretty heavy. You mean with, you mean with Thecla? Or? I mean, the whole concept of these philosophers or types of philosophy going in three different directions and all of that, I still don't get it. Well, he, what, he, what he's I'm saying there... I'm to explain it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. So this actually... Um, there's a long history in philosophy itself of when it comes to religion, of saying there's three kinds of religions... Um, and they all like point towards the same capital G God, but there are like three different paths. And Cicero talks about this in On the Nature of the Gods. Um, 
he says, well, there's the stuff for the, the ordinary people. And, and that's mostly BS. You know, sometimes this is civil, civic religion, we call this, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, you've got to keep all those rituals in place because that keeps people complacent and they've got their, their Saturnalia to go to and, and, you know, get drunk and then forget about, you know, the fact that we're, we're running the show. So you've got that going on. And that's not philosophical at all. That's, you know, statues and temples and, and rituals and all sorts of crazy stories about, you know, Ares sleeping with Aphrodite and getting caught up in a net and all that sort of thing. Then you've got what the poets are doing. And the poet, what they're doing is a little bit more elevated. And here you still have stories, right? And, you know, it could be, you know, ancient Greek poets or it could be, you know, the Norse uh, Eddas or it could be, um, you know, all the sort of stories that were generated uh, within the Christian world, you know, stories about the saints or, or things like that. Um, and, and that's another path. Um, and then, but it's, it's working with representations. And so it's always kind of muddy. And then you've got the philosophers, and they're the only ones who actually are, you know, rigorous and know what's going on. And nobody listens to them because... <laughs> Because this other stuff is a lot, you know, more enjoyable yeah. than to, to like sit and listen to some dry metaphysician explain, you know, why according to this argument God must have these attributes. But the philosophers are on the right track, and and so Cicero represents it, it that way. And you see this coming up over and over again in history. So like Averroes, uh, in, in in the Islamic world, will say something kind of similar, which is you know uh, kind of dicey because he's he's saying you've got like the ordinary people, you got the theologians. Oops. Looks like that that's dying. You got the the uh, um, theologians, and the theologians they, they kind of know what they're doing, but a lot of it's it's actually um, just images that they're working. And then you got the philosophers like me, Avaros, and what I'm doing is the real stuff, right? Yeah, I get it. So the philosophers yeah, are yeah. thinking about these issues in the the the, the poet and whatever this last group was. The, oh, the city, the the people using yeah. truth and like, representing it in certain ways, and the other people are just uh, enjoying it. Yeah, or not. But um, what she's saying is instead of thinking of it as three paths that are all like going to the same spot, right? Mm -hmm. Think of it as, why, why look at it that way? Why not say they're doing totally different things? They're not even talking the same language. Gotcha. Uh, and, and so, uh, yeah, that's, you know, uh, there's probably something kind of attractive about that. Um, another theme that I thought would be interesting to talk about is... Uh, and we've already touched on this a, a bit, is how do we make sense out of this future culture? So we're, we're given to believe that the author is really somebody else, Severian, and that somebody translated this, um, and that there are no exact correspondence between the things that are being talked about and the words that, that we have. So then, you know, a natural question to come up is, well, then how the hell do we make sense out of any of this, Right. Um, we have images, I think, in our head from some of the uh, words that he used, like destrier, right? If we say the word destrier, what do you think of? A war horse, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so but, he's like pulling a Dr. Seuss. Um, it, it, well, Dr. Seuss like made up words, right? Um, he's taking words that we don't usually use. But they're actual words? For the most part, yeah. Or they're derived from Greek and Latin. Like I, I brought up that word kakogen, which is used for these aliens. Kakos means evil or bad. And then gen is, you know, like a group or, or race, right? So the evil race. Um, you can, you, you know, you can easily do that with... with uh, Languages like Greek, you can string things together. Same thing in German. You can do that mm -hmm. quite easily in German. Um, what were you going to say? As there are, yeah, real words in there. He mentions the Popol Vol at one point, which is a Mayan sacred text. He mentions it as like a magic book huh. in one of these chapters. It's really fun when you can spot some of the words he uses and like recognize where they're from. But yeah, I, I believe him when he says he didn't make anything up. Well, one of the wives of somebody here is one of the magicians in that novel, in the Jack Vance dying earth sequence. 
one of the wives. The and, names of one of the wives of one of the characters okay. is referred to is one of the magicians from the Jack Vance Steiner. Yeah. So, so he's throwing them in there for you, for your edification. <laughs> yeah. That well, was his little tip of the hat to Jack Vance. Yeah. I mean, he's he's got in these appendixes, so he'll talk about um, different different aspects. Like this one is an, a note on provincial administration. Then he talks about archons, tetarchs. Uh, these you know these are all so these are all words that were used in ancient Greek. Um, we don't use them today anymore. Um, the, the lictor, the one who binds. Mm-hmm. Um, Clavengers, uh, who are the guards of the vincula, the demarchy, those who fight in two ways, are the uniform police. So he, he's 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 um he's using a language, and it's supposed to be a language that's translating a foreign language that none of us know, you know, um, and and it has these words, even if we can't, even if we don't know what they are, they're they're kind of evocative, just the way they sound. I think, you know. There's a wolf lexicon. I'm just kidding. Is there really? Yeah, somebody just told me that it, uh, one day at my other science fiction book. Club. And how uh, big is it? it must I don't be know. I, I've pretty... never seen it. I just heard the word that it exists, and, and he's not going to read any more wolf till he gets that book so that he can <laughs> figure out what's going on. Yeah. This is, uh, again, this is a little off topic, but. Um, you know, when, when you talk about Philip Dick, Sorry. every once in a while people will um, bring up the exegesis. And the exegesis is like this thick, you know? And people say, well, you can't understand Dick stories unless you read the exegesis. And, you know, you read the exegesis, uh, which, I, which I've done, and a lot of it you think, oh, some of this could have been edited, you know? It could have, could have been shrunk down. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't actually contribute that much to many of the the stories, but but a, a lexicon would. Yeah, you know. so you can look up those words and see what Wolf told you they were. Does it, I wonder if it tells you what the original use within Greek or Latin Maybe or whatever it is. Maybe it would be great. Yeah, that would, that would be helpful. Well, we're talking about what use of language points to it's not world building. Because he's using existing languages, existing geography, uh, so it's not world building in the sense of like creating a so completely it's not, brand yeah, new world, it's right? It's not in the sense of creating a brand new world. Yeah. Oh, I think it's world building. You think so? Right. Well, a lot of world building takes something from other worlds, but here you have, it's a dying earth. It's, yeah. That's the world, and mm-hmm. it's got it's got aliens, it's got space travel, it's got interdimensional travel, it's got time travel. It's got it's magic all in there, too, and it all fits into the story. To me, uh, that's world building. So oh, it see, takes place I, yeah. on old Earth at one time. So what? When I think of world building, I think of creating a whole new world, a whole new concept. But I mean, the only way we can, even like Tolkien was was using templates, right? So he's mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. he's creating new languages, but they they look kind of like you know the languages that he's teaching in in, mm-hmm. in his classes. Um, so they, I mean, if they were rad, if they were so radically different, we wouldn't be able to recognize them. I think as as anything, you know. So there always has to be some some drawing on the familiar. The question is how much of it you how can much, get away yeah. with it, right? Yeah. Um, let's talk about one of the other societies that that's in there that I thought was kind of a. Uh, he, you know, he, he gets into this, and again, he doesn't give you like the, the entirety of it, but they're the, the ones coming down from the north and, and fighting with the Commonwealth, the Askians. Um, there's a prisoner that he, he gets to, to meet, and they have a society that's very regimented, very, uh, um, what would you, it's a totalitarian society, essentially. But it's totalitarian beyond what most of our totalitarian societies are able to do in part because of the control of language. Um, they have this uh, this um, set of authorized texts, and everything that they they say it was all part of what they call correct thought. Everything has to come from these texts. So the 1984. Sort of mm-hmm. the with 1984, the uh, what the people in charge were trying to do is is reduce 
the vocabulary down to, I think they wanted 500 words, was it? Does anyone remember offhand? Yeah, they so, they, they, and they hadn't quite gotten there yet. With this, it's instead of um, just, a, just a, a, a set of words, it's phrases. And the phrases can be used to mean different things, but they only have a certain range of things that they can mean. So somebody will ask, I, I mean, I don't have any uh, examples of these, but um, somebody might say, well, do you want porridge or, uh, I don't know, meatloaf tonight? And then they would come up with one of these phrases, and somehow it would translate into, I, I want the meatloaf, you know, uh, and you'd get the meatloaf. And you only have those two options. I mean, I do have like one, I, I wrote down a few of the phrases. So here's one of them. All endeavors are conducted well or ill precisely insofar as they conform to correct thought. So you might say that like when you see somebody actually doing something well, or you might say that when you see somebody doing something badly, right? Uh, the same phrase could be used for multiple things. Whereas with Brave, with uh, not Brave New World, with uh, 1984, they're trying to reduce through Newspeak things down to just very rudimentary language because then people wouldn't be able to think outside of it. So, so they're kind of parallel to each other, soft right? Soft and hard saving the war. Oh, the Sapir Wharf hypothesis. They yeah, have the notion that language, the language that we have. Uh, conditions the reality that we can perceive or, yeah. or, or think of. Yeah. Because Newspeak is supposed to narrow down what you can perceive, while in this case, <coughs> people can, they can perceive more than they communicate. That's a good way to put it, yeah. Usually, the Sapir Whorf hypothesis is used to talk about like how the languages are constructed. So, um, you know, uh, I forget which, which of the guys was which. I think it was Sapir who was really interested in Native American languages mm -hmm. and their um, ways of depicting temporal and causal relations between things, which work differently than, say, English or the other Indo-European languages. Um, and so you want to say that, that those, those tribes using those languages could, could conceptualize time and space differently than, than we could. Um, no, I, I, and I don't. I think there's a problem with that. Insofar as we can talk about them conceptualizing it different, we must have some conception of what it is for them to to be doing that, right? Yeah. Well, that's um, why there's the strict and the less strict versions, and the science fiction writers tend to like making it strict. I think. Yeah. It's a bit more like using magic words, I think. Well, with magic words, do you have some sort of control over the thing, right? Because you know its name. Yeah. Um, how is that connected with the Sapir Whorf hypothesis? With the science fiction interpretation. Oh, of okay, it. okay. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's, so it's kind of an interesting society. I mean, think about what it would be like to fight against a, a race of people like that, you know? There's no compromising with them. You take them prisoner, they just babble at you in this weird language talking to you about correct thought, you know. Um, there, there's, a, there's sort of hints in there that they don't even have exactly the same emotions that we do, or the, the, the people of the story do, you know. Um, that they, they, they just, they're, they're, there's, there isn't this capacity for development that we have. Their, their society is very orderly. Ours is, or, and, and the Commonwealth in there is very haphazard, very, yeah, yeah. Nothing goes as planned. <laughs> it's always somebody bribing somebody or subverting the rules in some way. There are rules for breaking the rules. That's a good way to put it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And if you break the rules the wrong way, not That's following right, the better you rules. That's right, then you people who enforce the breaking of the rules properly. Which is, one of the yeah. biggest, which is one of the biggest arguments for totalitarianism is order. Yeah. Simplicity and order. You know, it's... Once you have something like what they're talking about as ASCIAN society, though, you can no longer even make the argument for why totalitarian society would be better. Because you can't, you can't think of anything outside of that. Mm -hmm. Non-totalitarian society would just be those... I mean, think about how they must perceive others. Savages. Maybe even less, because savages at least have a certain kind of structure, order. You know, you could be an ethnographer among them, and 
uh, maybe just like uh, insects or you know demons or demons that yes. came to my mind right you think away. yeah well yeah it's the if you're an other you're not human you're not like us yeah not, there are yeah. those societies exist mm -hmm. you can study them oh, if yeah. you can live long enough Yeah, I mean that would be the big challenge, right? How do you how do you observe them without them killing you? Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, there's a lot of science fiction about that, and a lot of yeah. times the elites they're you know skeptical of their own beliefs that they pr promote in their society, and that's part of the story is how the elites mm -hmm. have fun while everybody else sticks to the Margaret yeah. Atwood's Mar 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 yeah. Handmaid's Tale. You know, I I'd, I'd mentioned Cicero and uh, on the nature of the gods, and in that that dialogue, it's a dialogue between an Epicurean, a Stoic, and a, a skeptic. The skeptic is actually um, a priest in the Roman religion, and he admits. And Cicero, you know, he he you know went up through the the system of of offices. They called it the uh, cursus honorum. Um, and so one of that, the, you'd be connected with the religious establishment. He talks about them um, laughing as they're carrying out their augury because the common people believe all this stuff and the priests who are part of the elite are like, I can't believe we get away with this bullshit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a big thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and that was actually one of the other things that I, was, I, I thought would be kind of interesting to talk about is... Um, you know, social organization and politics and how you can never get away from it. Um, there's, you know, there's the autark and then there's all these sort of lower levels uh, and, and it's, uh, it's clear that somebody has to be in charge um, because otherwise things break down and, and the question is for, for what ends? You know, is the autark just enjoying himself? Is he responsible for everybody? Um, and you get different pictures of that as it goes on. And then you've even got like a resistance movement, this guy Vodalus, um, who um, Severian saves early on, um, and he gets, he gets connected up with him. Um, you know, you were talking about this being a coming-of-age thing and like falling in love uh, as being part of that. I guess, you know, having a hero to look up to who's kind of a rebel... And then getting connected with them and finding out that they're not quite what they they yeah, yeah, portray right. themselves as, or sure. what you thought they were, yeah, is, is, that's part of it. I guess that's kind of, yeah kind of a theme. Um, there's a line in there where where uh, um, one of the characters says, "Weak people believe what's forced on them; strong people what they wish to believe, forcing that to be real." What is the autark but a man who believes himself autark and makes others believe by the strength of it um, and, and you know if you think about a conservative society like that um, and there you know there's been many of these on uh, you know in our history um, most people they, they get the message about where they belong and that's that's where they are and if they're going to move up they move up in certain determinate ways and and at the same time there's always permeability to um, to those who are willing to break the rules and, and break them in ways that somehow work out for them, right? Um, so the autark, you know, what qualifies you to be autark? Wanting to be autark. Wanting to, to, to run the show. Um, and the guilds kind of, you know, fit into this as well. They're, they're ways of, of organizing things. But you notice that you can, you can uh, they're not absolute. You can break the guild rules and, and not be killed even by the torturers. You can be sent away with a, a nice sword and a job, you know, <laughs> like Severian is. Um, the other thing that I thought would be kind of interesting as a theme is, is uh, talking about the, the uh, role that love plays in this. Um, you know, and I don't think that, <clears throat> I don't know, you guys tell me if I'm wrong about this. I don't think there's anything like love in the sort of expansive sense of like love for everybody or Christian charity or something like that in these works. It's, it's more particular. It's, it's like erotic love for this person or that person or it's friendship or it's, um, you know, love for the, the comrade that you have. 
um, for for a certain time. Um, I don't see anything going beyond that. Uh, I don't think the autarch like loves the Commonwealth or the people of the Commonwealth. Um, he he feels responsible for them, but and he defends them. But I don't I don't I wouldn't say he loves them. Um, Severian well, if, has by, if by nature, if it's a look back by the autarch on his life. Yeah, he's fo focused on his own experiences, not on that broader picture of love for fellow man or things like that. Yeah, that's true. So it's more of an individual love, an individual experience. But he sees all these other people, and he he, you know, he, he speculates about them, and he has judgments on them. Mm -hmm. So presumably, if any of them were displaying that to to a great degree or talking about it. He'd have registered that, wouldn't he? Maybe, but I, I, if if the if if it's a look back, it's pretty centric to himself. Yeah. Yeah, but he's able to admit when he has abstract love for things like the guild, because he has mm -hmm. an attachment to them for quite a bit. Yeah. Would you call that love? How about affection? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, there was family growing up. That's right. Yeah. He liked some of those. He had torturers. <laughs> some better than others. His masters. Yeah. Well, you know. Father I, figures, I guess. No, no, yeah, I said they were fa like father figures. Yeah. Or big brothers. Yeah. Something. I mean, it's like he's in a boarding school, essentially. Uh, he just happened to be learning some very different topics, you know. <laughs> With a different Skills. different career track, <laughs> um, I suppose if you're in a situation like that, you would you would get you'd have some strong feelings about the people you're under. I mean, I think back to like my um, high school and, and middle school teachers, and many of them I can't remember at all, and then some of them I I really still dislike to this day, even though they're, <laughs> they're, they're gone, you know, many of them. Those are and, the ones you remember, man. <laughs> well, I remember some who I really liked, too, and some who I really admired. And, and, and I, there were a few where, as I've aged, and this, this has been the case, too, with some of my, my graduate school professors, um, as I've aged, my evaluation of them has changed. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, like, there was, there was one professor who... I uh, I only took a few classes with him. I didn't really like him at the time, um, but he actually was the person who gave me the best advice when I was a graduate student at the right time. And I, I recognize he was he was a pretty wise guy, um, uh, much wiser than the people who who I liked. <laughs> so, mm. so, yeah. And so if I mean if, if that I didn't like live with these these people. Um, so, I mean, imagine what it's like to, like, live in the same citadel or tower with, with people like that, have them control every aspect of your existence. It must be, you know, it would be more like being in the military, wouldn't it? Um, in, in, and not in peacetime, but, but in wartime. Where or you're, an you're, extended family with very strong religious values. Yeah, right yeah. Monastery. Okay, yeah, that would be, that, that, that works too. Certain yeah. kinds of boarding school mm -hmm. models. Yeah. yeah. Especially with the... Yeah. Are there any purely academic, like, living cohabitations where that is, like, existing? Purely academic. In um, this world or in that in, one? In, in our world. In this world. You know, there are, there are some Military colleges. Schools. Yeah. Military boarding schools. Yeah. Although that, not there, well, I mean, you do have, like, the ones that are training people for they are colleges, right? So, <clears throat> I think at the high school level, yeah, there's their their whole focus is to to get the boys structured, yeah, and obedient. So military school, so not, military, not, not academies, not academies, and okay. military schools. I mean, boarding if you had a boarding schools. school that was an academic one and it was kind of far out, where there's really nothing else around there except maybe cornfields mm -hmm. or desert. That would be similar mm -hmm. to that. You know, a lot of smaller schools try to produce, you know, one way for, for some smaller schools to try to produce a distinctive experience is to promote that, that very close connection. I imagine like St. John's 
uh, not the military school, but but the um, the the college mm-hmm. where they you know they have these very small classes. Uh, it's focused on on close readings of texts. Um, not a lot of professors. Yes. I think that would be like that. Has right? anyone read Donna Tartt's The Secret History? I have not. No, not no. Yet. Okay, because I a, I have it at home, but I haven't read it yet. It's about a private college where they close read Greek a bit and summon up the great god Pan and commit murders. No spoilers. Oh. <laughs> well, and I think about um, very conservative religious schools. Yeah. How yeah. about seminaries? We, seminaries? Yeah. yeah. There are some very conservative Christian religious small schools where it's very indoctrinal. There are people, mm-hmm. it's an indoctrination. Yeah, and I think with that too, you, so you, you leave school and you go home, but you're going home to a home that's the same deeply informed by that, and all of your yeah. social contacts are going to be are the same. those kids. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, seminaries would be like that. You know, I think about some, like the my mother's generation, many of the young men in that generation in my family went to junior seminary, and almost all of them washed out. Only one of them managed to go on and start preparing for the priesthood, uh, and then he um, met a, met a woman, you know, and, and uh, dropped out. Um, I think it depends on the seminary. Uh, I have a friend who went to Episcopal Seminary and dropped out because it wasn't it rigorous was, enough. It, no, it was more mind expanding. Okay. Than her belief system when she walked in. So it was like she found oh. out that some of these things weren't just exactly the way she'd been taught. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the theology, when she got into the broader theology and the broader concepts, it burst her bubble. That's, that's a common experience. Um, so rather when, than when marrying her, yeah. her world, it went the other direction Yeah. and threw her for a loop. You often see people from very conservative backgrounds um, swing, you know. <clears throat> they, they, they've been told so much, this is only this way, this is only this way, this is only this way. And then they find out that there's like a whole range of options. Um, you know, like when they learn church history and they see that there's like discussions among very reputable theologians about this, this topic and they didn't all believe the same thing. And then they, they sort of swing to the other extreme where they, they, uh, they're like, well, this is all... BS, and they become almost like fundamentalists of secularism, you know. Um, and it's that same sort of complex of, well, there's only one, you know, way that, that this can be. Um, I've seen that happen with quite a few colleagues, myself. I've also seen quite a few colleagues who go through uh, some sort of life crisis. Like they start out, you know, very, very conservative, committed Catholic. Uh, you know, the church's position is right on everything, and then suddenly they want to get divorced, and no, everything's kind of, you know, this is all up to interpretation. There's a good bit of that, too, I, I've seen as well over, over the they years. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I've seen people do that with political doctrines and, and, mm-hmm. and you know, other things as well. This is a private... Um, uh, all girls prep academy that was supposed to be Catholic based, except that they had was Jesuit, and they, um, you know, we yeah, the were, Jesuits are their own we kind of thing, aren't they? Doing, you know, Sard and Pierre de Chardin, and they're hiking us all down to Milwaukee to march with Father Grub. Anyway, I was the only one from my family that was sent there because the tuition was, and it was boarding, but I didn't have to board because I lived in the city. Yeah. But the tuition was higher than my college. Wow. My mom was working. I mean, it was expensive. Yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway. It wasn't what she was, it didn't unradicalize her daughter. Well, you know, I mean. <laughs> it didn't straighten her out. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is, this is. It made her worse. This is sort of like a dirty, I mean, we're, we're way off of Wolf at this point. This is a sort of dirty little secret about Catholic academia. Catholic, so um, Catholic. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and he wouldn't have any problem with. He chipped right in. He yeah. Sitting the table. So you, you get all these schools where the, the parents, you know, they, they want to send their kids to it because they're alumni, and they're like, I'm going to give my kid the, you know, this or that experience. And I won't name any, any, any schools, but there's plenty that I could sort mm-hmm. of point to. Mm-hmm. And where that school is now, today, you know, 20 to 30, well, 30 years later, usually, um, is so radically different 
And so there, there, there's so little Catholic identity left in, in, in that school that the parents are sending their kids to something completely, you know, uh, at odds with, with what they, they, they themselves thought they were going to get, unless they do the investigation and see. You know, a lot of it has to do with, like, what does the core look like, you know? Um, I've seen a lot of Catholic schools do core revisions recently where the, the kids, whether they liked it or not, would, would need to take three theology classes, three philosophy classes, three literature, three history, and now it's like one of each, and that's that one's so generic that you're not going to really learn anything. Uh, and then you know, like one, you know, one other thing in this basket over here. And and once you lose the core, and and the reason you lose the core is because the STEM majors say, oh, there's you're you're making them take too many Gen Ed classes, you know. And then you get other people who are like, ah, oh, why why does it have to be so Catholic, you know? Well, it is Saint such and such, you know, <laughs> or it is Catholic such and such. Well, you also see the schools tend to be run by orders like the Jesuits, yeah, like the school system Notre Dame. Who are more progressive? Yeah, yeah. Than, than the laity. Than, than the laity. And, and, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's some of the laity. To unradicalize. Yeah. I mean, it just was so comical because I was. I, I always thought that. Well, you were there at the was, right time was, too. Well, yes, I was. It was <laughs> bullshit from the beginning. So they'd always be sending me to talk to priests because I questioned everything. I said, "This doesn't make any sense. This is all BS." And they'd say, "Oh my God, what's wrong with you?" Blah 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 blah. I said, well, "It doesn't make any sense because I'm really hyper rational." Yeah. So um, that was just part of the way I'm constructed. So then they thought this was going to work, and it didn't work. But <laughs> yeah, I grew up in a non-traditional Catholic family, where my grandfather would say, "Yeah, the priest puts his pants on one leg at a time, just like I do. What does he know?" Did everybody, everybody <laughs> you grew up Catholic. I, I did, but I, I left the church I when, I, oh, yeah. when, I, when I was 16. I left the church. Did you? Yeah. Did you? you yep. Well, this is Wisconsin, so. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was like, Lutheran. Come on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Hey, so I have a question about Wolf. Why yeah. A question about Wolf. Sure, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so is, is Severian an unreliable narrator? That's that's one of the key questions in, in all, of, like, the secondary lit. So. I would say yes, because he's he's looking at everything from his own perspective. Yep. And does he actually get caught in a lie? Don't we all? <laughs> in the book. It's a, it's where, book. Where there's a contradiction between there's a contradiction. two things. People say they caught them, so I looked when I was reading it. And I, did, I, I didn't get past this. I read them before. Yeah. So this time I got through the first two. And I, did, I do remember him saying he had plenty opportunities for sex in the city at some point. But all along he'd been claiming his only... Sexual relationship was with Thecla. This is in. Point. This was in. Uh, in the first. Book. The, okay, so in the in the, yeah. the, the, he, the says, Citadel. he says, well, you know, they they asked question him. He said, I could relate back to my many experiences in the city, and basically, he only went that one time to the whorehouse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then he had Thecla, and so that's. that's well, the, later on, he's going to have Dorcas. Well, no, but this Agia. is before that. Yeah, 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 yeah. before yeah. before that. Before his um, grandmother. Maybe just Bragan. <laughs> yeah, I thought they were going to agree. Like, it didn't want to admit that he had less experience than he had. I'm trying to remember the exact words. Well, the, the question then is, does that make him... A, Maybe that uh, was How much does it take to make you unreliable? Yeah, does, so, does lying about one thing... He's certainly trying to appear honest to the reader. Like uh, when Alia shows up, he stops, he record scratches for a bit to talk about, you have to understand, I thought she was really hot and all of my dumb decisions spread from this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But is that unreliable? Or is, no, I, I... Or is that... To me, that sounded very reliable. It's so kind of... Like it's trust a teenager. That's a young man. Yeah. 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 Growing up. Yeah, looking at things from that perspective. It's kind of like the courtroom thing, right? Where you you've got you've got somebody on the stand, and you say, "Okay, we've caught you in a lie about this. How can we trust anything you're saying?" Right? Mm -hmm. So the I guess the question then is, what does it take to be unreliable? Um, do we have to catch him in several contradictions? Um, I mean, what do, well, what do you I think? didn't. I didn't, and I was looking, but I didn't get to three and four. And I, mm. I'll just say this: that the people who were talking about this were on their second and third readings. Yeah. And they were really looking for things, and there's a lot in there that you don't think about. One of the things I always thought about Wolf that was so fascinating, and I don't see it as much in these, but as some of his other books, is that things happen off 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 camera. 
Yeah. And there's some reference to them. And it seems vague and you wonder what. Mm -hmm. And then a, a chapter later, there's, there's a revelation, but you're not sure that was the time and you have to go back and look. And this happens a lot with Wolf and his other works, not so much in these. I, I remember reading one. I just spent the whole book doing it. It was one of the uh, short sun. And, I, and it was such an, an incredible book at the end. I had tears rolling down my eyes. It was just an amazing work. And I recommend people read more Wolf if mm -hmm. you like this because there's some of his stuff. The short sun, I really liked. The long sun, uh, I got bored with all the theology and all the tra travings of, of uh, priesthood, and you know, by the fourth one, the third one, I quit. But the short, but the, the, not the short sun, the, Long yes, the sun. short yeah. sun. Oh, the short sun. sun. It's when they're on a new earth. They're on a new planet, and they're trying to make it on this the new, new planet. Sun? The new sun. This is the new sun. sun. This yeah. is the old earth, but it's the new sun. Yeah. <laughs> it's the short sun. Okay. There are three of them, and they're just <laughs> fascinating. I just just really like them. And I have a few extra copies, which if I come for Paul, I'll bring them along. Anybody can have them that wants them. Cool. Yeah. I couldn't find anything on Paul that was even close to this. I'm oh. It's just so little I couldn't even find in the libraries. There, well, you can you can oh, order that on Amazon for like about ten dollars oh, or so. Okay. Yeah. So um, should we should we call this one to a close and uh, say thanks for a great discussion? Uh, and we've it's been a, a good year again, year three. Now we're moving into year four of this uh, Worlds of Speculative Fiction series, so 